A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 29th January 2021. These are the list of news articles chosen for today's analysis. It has been provided along with the page numbers of different editions of Hindu newspaper. So let us start our discussion with this first news article. This news article mentions that 18 opposition parties have announced their decision to boycott president's address to the joint sitting of parliament at the start of budget session. and this is in concurrence with the farmers who are protesting the three formulas but our focus here should be on the joint sitting of the parliament because it is important from the exam perspective so in this discussion let's have a brief understanding on the joint sitting of parliament and its relevance the syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference now one of the constitutional provisions which is relevant to this joint sitting is the article 87 it provides for the special address by the president now this article provides for joint sitting because it mentions that president shall address both houses of parliament assembled together and this article provides for joint sitting in two occasions the first occasion is at the commencement of the first session after each general election and the second occasion is at the commencement of the first session of each year that is generally the budget session and as the article mentions the president shall address both houses of parliament assembled together and inform the parliament about the causes for which they have been summoned now such an address is what is called as special address and it is an annual feature now here note that until the president has addressed both the houses of parliament which are assembled together no other business is transacted in the parliament now regarding the two occasions under this article where joint sitting is provided in this the first occasion if you see in case of the first session after each general election to lok sabha the president addresses both houses of parliament after the members have made and subscribed the oath or affirmation and after the speaker has been elected now with regard to the second occasion that is at the commencement of first session of each year if at that time lok sabha is not in existence and it has been dissolved at the time of commencement of the first session of the year then rajya sabha has to meet and rajya sabha can have its session without the president's address and here note that this has already happened in 1977 when during the dissolution of lok sabha rajya sabha had its session without president's address so what is present in this president's address see this president's address is a statement of policy of the government and it is drafted by the ruling government the address contains a review of various activities and achievements of the government during the previous year and it sets out the policies projects and programs which the government wishes to pursue about the important national and international issues and this address also indicates the items of the legislative business which are proposed to be brought during the sessions that will be held in that particular year and after the conclusion of such address both the houses meet separately in their respective chambers when a copy of the president's address is laid on their table and after distributing the address to the members of the both houses they can discuss and even submit amendments to the president's address and here note that the scope of this discussion is very wide and members have the liberty to speak on every matter of national or international importance and other issues and this address of president is discussed in both houses of parliament on a motion and this motion is called as the motion of thanks at the end of the discussion the motion is put to vote now this motion must be passed in the lok sabha otherwise it amounts to the defeat of the government because we saw that this address is drafted by the ruling government and generally 3 days are allotted for the discussion on the motion of thanks and the time allotted by the house for discussion on the motion of thanks is distributed amongst various parties and groups in proportion to their strength in the house and at the end of such discussion the prime minister replies to the debate and thereafter the amendments are disposed and then the motion of thanks is put to vote in the house and if any of the amendments is accepted then the motion of thanks is adopted in the amended form So this is the general idea about the president's address and the following motion of thanks. Now like the article 87 which you already saw there are also other articles that provide for joint sitting of parliament but for different purposes. And these articles are article 86 and article 108. Now in this article 86 provides that the president may address either house of the parliament or both houses assembled together and for that purpose requires the attendance of members. However since the commencement of the constitution there has not been any occasion when the president has addressed either house or both houses assembled together under the provision of this particular article now what about article 108 now this article is for resolving the deadlock 
and this article directly provides for joint sitting of both houses in certain cases see a deadlock may arise between the houses regarding the bills and here the deadlock means when a bill passed by one house is rejected by the other house or uh, it could also mean that the houses have finally disagreed to the amendments to be made in the bill and it is also a deadlock when more than 6 months have elapsed from the date of receipt of the bill by the other house without the bill being passed by it see for example if lok sabha passes a bill and then it is presented in the rajya sabha and after this 6 months have elapsed but rajya sabha has not passed that bill this scenario is a deadlock situation so to resolve these deadlock situations president can summon joint sitting of both the houses and who presides over such a joint sitting the speaker of lok sabha presides over the joint sitting of the two houses and in her absence the deputy speaker presides over the joint sitting and if the majority of members present and voting in the joint sitting approves the bill then the bill is deemed to be passed by both the houses and here most importantly from exam perspective what you should note is that such kind of disagreement which results in deadlock may arise in case of bills other than money bills and constitutional amendment bills see there is no provision for holding a joint sitting of both the houses of parliament if there is a deadlock over the passage of constitutional amendment bill and money bills but on the other hand a provision for joint sitting is made in the case of uh, ordinary bill and financial bills other than money bills it is because in case of money bill the lok sabha has overriding powers and as you are aware constitutional amendment bill must be passed by each house separately and what about the joint sitting which we are discussing today it is based on article 87 where the president addresses both the houses at the start of the first session of the year and as we have said before 18 opposition parties have decided to boycott president's address to the joint sitting of parliament and here you should note that this session is a budget session that is the budget for financial year 2021-22 will be introduced in this session so let us wait and see what president is going to say and we'll be discussing all these aspects in the succeeding hindi news analysis videos so these are all the points that you should know with respect to joint sitting and the occasions when such a sitting is mandated now let us move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this opaid article which talks about the different hate forms and the need to overcome them it is written in the wake of commemoration of the holocaust memorial ceremony see every year on january 27th the un department of global communications and unesco in cooperation with the international holocaust remembrance alliance they commemorate the holocaust memorial ceremony by reaffirming their commitment to counter antisemitism racism and other forms of intolerance and this january 27th is chosen because it was the day in which the soviet troops entered and freed the survivors of auschwitz Birkenau in Poland. Now this Auschwitz Birkenau was a German Nazi concentration and extermination camp from where the survivors were freed. So in this regard, let's learn in brief about different forms of hate. Let's start with the Holocaust. It was a period in history at the time of World War II when millions of Jewish and other people were killed for their identity and they were killed by the Germany's Nazi party which was led by Adolf Hitler. See the Nazis were racist who believed in the superiority of Aryan race and they considered that Jews, Romas or Gypsies then black people and other ethnic groups are inferiors to Aryan race and because of this belief they deliberately killed large number of people and that is why holocaust is an example of genocide because genocide means to deliberately kill a large group of people usually because they belong to a certain nationality race or religion Now next comes anti-semitism. Actually Holocaust was also based on anti-semitism. As per the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, anti-semitism refers to a perception about the Jews which is expressed as a kind of hatred towards them. Anti-semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiring to harm humanity and it is often used to blame Jews when things go wrong. Now such feelings of anti-semitism are expressed in speech, writing, visual forms and actions. And another infamous form of hate is racism and it can be broadly defined as behaviors practices policies beliefs and prejudices across groups in society which is based not only on race but also on ethnicity culture or religion now the racial abuse refusal of service racial stereotyping and microaggressions are some of the forms of racism now apart from these major ones there are also other forms of intolerance this includes xenophobia which means prejudice that people from other countries groups cultures or other languages are a threat then uh, other forms of intolerance also includes romophobia anti gypsyism religious intolerance then gender based discrimination and also finally homophobia that is the aversion to homosexuality and lgbt community 
and unfortunately in the current world these forms of intolerance are increasing and this is due to the role played by social media and anonymity provided by the internet see social media or internet has increased the screen time and the exposure to hate speeches on online platforms and they in turn intensify the various forms of divisions in our society and according to the tel aviv university in israel pandemic have aggravated antisemitism worldwide by attributing blame to the jewish people and using them as a scapegoat but if you ask are there any measures to reduce such intolerance behaviors and ideologies there are various measures taken by various organizations and among them un emphasizes the use of education as a potent tool to inculcate a culture of peace but here authors are of the opinion that education cannot be a sole solution to this problem because learning beyond books is also significant this is due to the fact that there were also occasions where highly educated people also sustain hatred authors also point out the role played by online platforms in distorting the reality and encouraging hatred for example as per a report by world jewish congress more than 100 posts per day on an average had denied the holocaust So in this regard the UNESCO along with IHRA UN and the European Commission has launched a campaign called the Protect the Facts and this campaign has been launched to commemorate the victims of Holocaust by promoting effective policies and practices that raise awareness about the Holocaust denial and distortion so that means social media and internet is not only used to conduct intolerance behaviors and hate crimes but they are also used to deny the historical facts that point to such hate crimes and genocide so in this regard as a conclusion authors stress on the need to empower people to question and engage in critical reflections on the causes and effects of hate crime they also suggest to equip people as active bystanders to have a peaceful and sustainable society so these are some of the points that you should know with respect to this oped article now let's move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this editorial article which talks about the monopolistic behavior of big tech firms on the internet so let us discuss the aspects mentioned by the author in detail The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. We all know that internet is a public resource that has no ownership, but it is available to all those who are digitally connected. Its importance is increasing in the society day by day. So this increasing importance has led to an intense debate about how to preserve and enhance this shared resource as an open platform for all communications. And this is what is exactly the author talks about. So to understand it, let's first see what is this monopoly. See, in June 2019, the Competition Commission of India announced that it was conducting a market study on e-commerce in India. While doing so, the Competition Commission of India, which is India's antitrust regulator, it gave the first public indication about the unfamiliarity of challenges which is posed by the internet platforms. See here, as per the definition, antitrust means a group of laws established to regulate the business practices in order to ensure that fair competition occurs in an open market economy for the benefit. of consumers and in india the competition commission of india is the antitrust regulator so in this regard in its statement cci has admitted that the present competition laws may not be equipped to deal with the shape shifting and surprising challenges that is posed by the nature of internet platforms to the competition regulation and here it should be also noted that globally regulators and legislators have been waking up to the threat posed by the dominance of internet platforms to competitors for example various us publications have reported that alphabet incorporated's uh, subsidiary that is google then uh, facebook incorporated and then amazon.com incorporated they are all being investigated about the competition related matters and if you see recently the justice department of usa sued google for abusing its dominance in the online search and advertising and in this regard the us deputy attorney general stated that google has maintained its monopoly power through exclusionary practices that are harmful to competition see when we say exclusionary practices it means uh, contracts pricing strategies and more generally the actions that are taken by the dominant firms to deter the new competitors from entering an industry and through these exclusionary practices the dominant firms compel their rivals to exit prevent them from expanding and all these ultimately causes harm to the consumer so now it is said that google has used exclusionary practices to maintain its monopoly but here author notes that many compare these investigations with the earlier antitrust investigations which were conducted in the us on telecom monopoly 
here author talks about uh, the example of AT&T company where the Department of Justice of USA accused this company of engaging in anti-competitive behavior and argued that the company should sell off some of its subsidiaries and with respect to this what author notes is that there are some key differences between telecom and internet because lot of changes happened over the time with the expansion of new world called internet so what are these changes first as we all know that internet provides us with information and this information can be seen as goods and services and here author opines that this information good that is provided by the internet firms of today is largely a public good see when we say public good it has two characteristics one is that it is non rivalry this means that when a good is consumed it doesn't reduce the amount available for others for example if i'm benefiting from a street light then it doesn't reduce the light being available for others but if i eat an apple then it would not be available for others so in this scenario the internet radio stations television shows etc are all examples of goods that are non rival and the second characteristic is the non excludability and this occurs when it is not possible to provide a good without it being possible for others to enjoy for example if you construct a dam to stop flooding then that means we are protecting everyone in the area so in the same way the information good is largely non rival and everyone has access to use them and their use does not deplete their availability for future use but on the other hand if you see a private good is a rival good which is something that can only be possessed or consumed by a single user and the example for this private good could be food clothing electronic goods etc so in the same way we can logically say that information is a public good because the consumption of information by one does not alter the value of information for others but what is the case with telecom in telecom if you see due to the limited network capacity the consumption by one has an effect of decreasing value for the others and hence this telecom is rival in nature so this is the first difference that is internet can be termed as a public good but telecom cannot be now the second difference is with respect to the jurisdiction so as you know telecom services are within the jurisdictional boundaries of regulators for example in india we have the tri that is the telecom regulatory authority of india and hence the regulators have the power to lay down the rules for the orderly behavior of the licensed telecom operators but on the other hand if you see the internet firms they operate globally therefore it is often difficult to lay down international rules of obligation and verify their fulfillment by the different country regulators now the third difference is that telecom is certainly excludable due to the need for consumers to obtain connections and the need to pay the subscription charges for the same but on the other hand internet firms provide search navigation and social connectivity with no charge to the consumers and consequently they make these services non excludable but if you see the information goods are mostly provided by private firms and at the same time they need to generate revenue in order to run their businesses and this commercialization of internet which happened over time has created a new form of non excludability so what is this new form this includes subtle trade offs of personal information for availing services of internet firms see to make it simple let us take the example of facebook we know that facebook helps us to connect with our friends but at the same time facebook uses the information from our activities on the facebook page to target us with ads or advertisements but here there is one problem that is it can lead to abusive monopoly but how it leads to abusive monopoly because of the strong network effects present in these internet platforms see the term network effect refers to any situation in which the value of a product service or platform depends on the number of buyers sellers or users who leverage it that is who purchase it and typically the greater the number of buyers sellers or users the greater the network effect and the greater the value which is created by the offering so here the author opines that this network effects create a huge consumer surplus and many of today's most popular companies and startups they are heavily influenced by network effects such as if you take uh, e-commerce it includes ebay amazon alibaba etc and if you take social media it includes uh, facebook instagram linkedin etc so even though they have some positive sides such as uh, the services provided these internet firms have now become an indispensable part of our lives for example we use google maps every day for our day to day commute but at the same time they also have some negative effects also so what is it 
So in order to leverage the benefits of uh, network effect, companies try to increase the subscriber base and gather as much market share as possible. Now, this results in near monopoly of some firms in their defined markets. And in order to retain their position, these firms may resort to anti-competitive behavior like uh, by erecting entry barriers, by refusing to interconnect and also driving out competitors, etc. So they may resort to exclusionary practices. And that is why as a conclusion, author provides a way forward to reduce the threats posed by this monopoly. One way which is suggested by the author is that the firms should go for controlled expansion of products and services without hurting the interests of consumers and small competing firms. Then internet firms should also adhere to core ethical principles in conducting their businesses. Now the other way to control any abusive behavior of the internet firms is a strong public voice. So public should be vigilant enough to eliminate the monopoly of service providers. So these are the points that you should note with respect to this editorial article. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about a new index called as COVID Performance Index. So now let us see some of its important findings and facts from exam perspective. First know that this COVID Performance Index has been compiled by Lowy Institute. This is an independent Australian think tank. This index sought to assess the impact of geography, political systems and economic development in handling of the pandemic. Now this index is compiled based on six different indicators. They are confirmed cases, confirmed death, confirmed cases per million people, confirmed deaths per million people, confirmed cases as a proportion of tests, then tests per thousand people. So an average across these indicators is then calculated for individual countries in each period and they have been further normalized to produce a score from 0 to 100. So in this 0 means worst performing and 100 means best performing. So collectively these indicators point to how well or how poorly countries have managed the pandemic in the 36 weeks that followed their 100th confirmed case of COVID-19. So in this index 98 countries have been evaluated and their average scores have been provided for their ranking. So what is India's rank? India has been ranked at 86th position out of 98 countries because it has scored only an average of 24.3. But if you take USA, it is at the 94th position, worse than India, and uh, Brazil at the bottom of the index. But to our surprise, Vietnam and New Zealand are the best performing countries and even Taiwan, Thailand and Cyprus are in the top 5 ranking. And here you can see the comparison between some of our neighbors and India. And as you can see here, Sri Lanka has fared well and it is the best faring nation in the South Asia also. And it has been ranked at the 10th position. And Maldives have been ranked at 25th position. And Pakistan is at 69th position. Nepal is at 70th position. And Bangladesh is at 84th position. But note that China was not included in this index due to lack of publicly available data on testing. So even though the coronavirus outbreak started in China, countries in the Asia-Pacific have proved the most successful at containing the pandemic. This is one of the important findings of this index. And even the level of economic development and regime type were less significant than actually expected in containing the pandemic. And this has been attributed to the relatively low-tech nature of the health measures that was used to mitigate the spread of the virus. So the level of economic development and regime type did not actually matter in containing the pandemic. So these points, you can take note of it and you can also use these data in your main answer writing. With this, we come to the end of this discussion. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about the success of life mission of Kerala. See, this is a social sector initiative of Kerala government. You may think that why we are discussing a state initiative. See, this is important because already in UPSC 2019 mains examination, there was a question based on the project of Kerala that appeared in GS Paper 3. The question was on Cyberdome project. This means that there is a possibility for asking questions on important state-related social sector initiatives as well. So it is better to have an understanding about those social sector initiatives that are often seen in the news. So in this context only, we are going to see some important details about this life mission. First note that the full form of life in this life mission is livelihood, inclusion and financial empowerment. Now this mission is a project implemented by the state government of Kerala and it was launched in November 2016. It is a massive housing campaign to build houses for those families that are without land or housing. And in this mission, emphasis will be on financial empowerment and providing means of livelihood. 
So what is the objective of this mission? The aim of this mission is to provide safe and decent housing within five years for beneficiaries to live on their own and to be a part of the community and also to benefit from the social welfare schemes. So under this mission, the homeless people will be provided with modern housing complexes with provision for pursuing their livelihoods. Along with this, other provisions for various social services will also be provided, which includes primary health care, geriatric support, skill development and provision for financial services inclusion. So in short, this mission life aims at ensuring the secure feeling of an own house. It aims at helping people to make houses, those who have land, and it also aims at assuring homes in apartments for more than 150,000 landless people. Along with this, it aims at providing geriatric and palliative care. See, geriatric care is a specialized care type that's focused only on older adults. And palliative care is a specialized medical care for people who are living with serious illness. So this mission will provide both these cares. And as you already saw, this mission is not just confined to providing housing alone, but it will also provide financial empowerment that will ensure livelihood means. Now, this mission provides financial assistance to houseless families. Those have land for the construction of new houses at the rate of uh, 3.5 lakh rupees. And this is for the people belonging to general category. And the same amount increases to 4 lakhs for the people belonging to scheduled castes and then fishermen and plantation workers. But here note that the beneficiaries in the scheduled tribe category, they will be assisted with the actual amount for the completion of the house. Along with this, social security schemes will be initiated in the housing complexes as well as skill training for adults among the beneficiaries will be initiated under this scheme. Now, who are all the beneficiaries of this scheme? First, homeless persons, then landless people, then people who are unable to complete housing or who have inadequate housing, then people who have temporary housing on the outskirts, coastal areas or garden areas. These people are the beneficiaries under this scheme. Now, the funds for this life mission is received from the proceeds of the local self-government's plan allocation and it is also received from Corporate Social Responsibility Fund and then also from credit available through the Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board. And now today's news is that around 2.5 lakh houses have been built by this life mission. And according to Kerala government data, this has enabled over 10 lakh people in the state to lead dignified lives. And that is why the news article mentions that this housing project has completed a milestone. So these are some of the points that you should know with respect to life mission. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article, which talks about the new U.S. administration's position on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that is JCPOA or simply the Iran nuclear deal. The new administration of USA has stated that if Iran becomes compliant with the terms of JCPOA, then the US would re-enter the deal. So in this regard, remember that the previous Trump administration of USA had pulled out of the deal in 2018 itself. Now at the same time, now Iran has also missed the call by US for Iran to return to the full compliance of JCPOA. In this regard, Iran has stated that U.S. had violated JCPOA with its unilateral withdrawal. And after this, U.S. had also imposed sanctions that blocked food and medicine to the Iranians. So in this context, let us have a brief understanding of JCPOA or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. See, this JCPOA is a deal which was adopted in 2015 and it was signed after years of deliberation by the P5 countries, Germany, European Union and Iran. See here, P5 countries are the five permanent members of United Nations Security Council, which are the USA, UK, France, China and Russia. And because of this, this deal is also called as P5 plus 1 plus EU Iran deal. Now, the objective of this deal was nuclear non-proliferation in Iran. See, proliferation means rapid increase. So, this deal aims at reduction in nuclear weapons. And this was to be done by reduction or by cutting the Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium. So, the important provisions of this deal was a significant reduction in Iran's uranium stockpile, then limitations on enrichment of uranium, so that uranium's use will be limited to produce energy and not in producing nuclear weapon. So, Iran agreed for all these terms in return for lifting economic sanctions, which were imposed on Iran by the United Nations, United States and also by the European Union. And according to the deal, Iran's compliance with the nuclear-related provisions of the JCPOA will be verified by the International Atomic Energy agency that is IAEA and this will be done according to certain requirements set forth in the agreement. 
and in this regard jcpo also established a joint commission which had a representation from all the negotiating parties and this joint commission was to monitor the implementation of the agreement and it is to be noted that in 2018 itself the then us administration under mr trump unilaterally declared its withdrawal from the deal and the reason cited by us for this was iran's continuing support for the terror groups such as hamas and hezbollah in the middle east so usa's withdrawal practically made the deal ineffective because usa was the big player and it had withdrawn its support and as a response to this iran has been enriching its uranium stockpile step by step so this is the scenario and now after the change of us administration under mr biden now usa is willing to re-enter the deal if iran becomes compliant with the terms of jcpoa so these are some of the developments regarding this deal now let's move on to the next discussion now we have come to the last session the practice questions discussion session now in this let us first take two previous year questions that were based on joint sitting of parliament now this question was asked in prelims 2012 and the question asks a deadlock between the lok sabha and the rajya sabha calls for a joint sitting of the parliament during the passage of ordinary legislation money bill constitution amendment bill now during discussion we clearly said that joint sitting is not prescribed when there is a deadlock in case of money bill or constitution amendment bill because in case of money bill the lok sabha has overriding powers and the constitutional amendment bill must be passed by each house separately so that means 2 and 3 should not be in the answer and hence the correct answer to this question is option a one only now this next question it was asked in prelims 2015 the question asks when a bill is referred to a joint sitting of both the houses of the parliament it has to be passed by a simple majority of members present in voting 3/4 majority of members present in voting 2/3 majority of the house absolute majority of the houses and the correct answer to this question is option a if there is a majority of members present in voting in the joint sitting approves the bill then the bill is deemed to have been passed by both the houses and this means the simple majority so the correct answer is option a now let us take this practice question on joint session or joint sitting first statement mentions article 108 of indian constitution alone provides for the joint sitting or session of the parliament now this statement is incorrect because during discussion we saw about article 87 and 86 also Now the second statement is in case of disagreement between the two houses over a bill president can summon a joint sitting of the two houses to resolve the deadlock. Now you have to be very careful while reading this statement because it mentions disagreement between the two houses over a bill. It doesn't specify which type of bill or which kind of bill because as you know in case of money bill and constitution amendment bill joint sitting is not prescribed. So this statement is incorrect because it talks about all the bills. And here the question asks for the incorrect statements and both the statements are incorrect so the correct answer is option C both 1 and 2 Now this next question is based on JCPOA first statement is its objective is non proliferation of biological weapons by Iran Now this statement is incorrect because its objective is non proliferation of nuclear weapons by Iran Second statement is it was signed by the permanent five members of UNSC that is United Nations Security Council Germany European Union and Iran This statement is correct and the P5 members are US UK France China and Russia And here the question asks for the correct statements so the correct answer is option B two only Now this next question is a very direct question which asks which of the following entities or institutions compiled covid performance index and the correct answer is option D Lowy Institute so this is the reason why we discuss even small articles so that if you just know that this is released by this institute you can easily gain two marks by answering this question correctly Now this next question asks consider the following statements with reference to project the facts recently seen in news First statement is it is a campaign launched by UNESCO UN and the European Commission and this statement is correct along with them even IHRA was present that is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Now the second statement is it aims to promote effective policies and practices that raise awareness about holocaust denial and distortion this statement is also correct And here the question asks for the incorrect statements but both the statements are correct. So the correct answer to this question is option D neither one nor two. Now let us take two main question. This question is about network effect and the anti competitive behavior of major tech firms and this is a previous year question which is about joint session of two houses of parliament. You can answer these questions and post it in the comment section. With this we come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis. If you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation.